Hello and welcome back to the Page Side Podcast. I'm your host, the HOD of the BSB. Like, share, comment on the YouTube version of this podcast, and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Enable notifications to receive all the updates from these podcast episodes and all the content on the channel, of course. Follow us on social media and website PSP on Twitter, Page Side Pod on Instagram. And you can listen to this on Spotify, Google Podcasts, or any other platform. Join us here for episode 145. Notice, by the way, finally, we have a proper intro for the channel now, so congratulations for us anyway. Welcome and join us for more. We just cannot start the episode elsewhere but the Champions League semi-final and finally, Pep Guardiola got rid of this very big issue that is getting to a Champions League final um, for the first time in 10 years. He gets to the Champions League final with Manchester City after renewing the victory against PSG. 2-0 at the Etihad Stadium. This was a game that that was the same game as the first leg. This was a carbon copy, really, with an even worse game management from Pochettino and an even better one from uh, Pep Guardiola. Of course, as we mentioned yesterday, it hinged a lot on whether Pep Mbappe is fit or not. He wasn't. I mean, he was an unused sub, to be fair, so the option could have been there, but definitely Pochettino shouldn't risk him um, and he was right. I mean, the player's health, I think, is more important anyways. Um, but still, PSG started with the wrong setup and method more than the wrong um, starting eleven. I mean, there were some choices that were weird uh, in terms of the starting eleven. Um, realistically speaking, you start with someone like Florenzi on the right back. Doesn't give you the same amount of effectiveness you need. You start with a Cardi up front. You basically started with 10 men when you started with a Cardi because a Cardi doesn't drop. He doesn't move a lot. He, he's, I mean, he spent most of the season on the fringes, so it's really hard to expect him to be very intense or to be very effective or to be very mobile once you bring him on um, for, for this kind of game. So PSG started with a 4-2-3-1, changed the system, of course, and with Idris Gay being sent off last week in the, in the first leg, they started with Under Herrera and Paredes. Verratti played mostly as a number 10. PSG started strong. Really, um, you know, and I mean, started strong is a relative word, really. Just started on the front foot, let's say that way. Um, you know, they played a game that was pretty much focused on trying to, you know, trying to break down Manchester City, which is not the way to do it. Like, you cannot break a team like Man City, at least Man City this season, who will be happy to sit at the back and will just defend for a little while and, you know, do not have like 70 or 80% possession in the game. They tried to take the game to them in the first 15 to 20 minutes, which was, again, predictable. I really expected them to do so. Man City defended well and kept cool under the pressure, even though PSG didn't create really dangerous opportunities per se. They didn't really put Man City under serious danger in those 20 minutes. I mean, there was a chance for Marquinhos on the crossbar, but I think aside from that, there was nothing really significant in um, in the game itself. However, that start, of course, from PSG was their own undoing. They were left high and dry, and City took advantage of that in the first goal. Of course, Edison Mirage with a beautiful pass, long-range one towards Zinchenko, who found just acres of space behind Florenzi and was running and running and running. And the, ba- and, and the rebound from PSG, from offensive to defensive, was so bad in that goal that certainly, um, y- you know, I mean, you look at the game and you say how Bayern didn't qualify w- with that kind of defending that PSG had. Anyways, Riyad Mahrez scored the first goal and opened the game for Man City, and I think this was a different ball game, and this made PSG even more frantic, I would say, in in their play. I mean, trying to, to do too much in, in, in too little of a time. Neymar, in particular, was so... I mean, was all over the place, really, and not in a good way. Like, was all over the place, not knowing what to do exactly, trying to make rash decisions of shooting or passing instead of shooting. And, you know, PSG were too focused on breaking down um, Man City that it couldn't open the game properly. And the fullbacks didn't help. Not, you know, either Diallo or Florenzi didn't help, really. Um, Not too much support because, I mean, there was just Neymar and Di Maria and Icardi there. And again, no, I mean, I'm not going to count Icardi because he wasn't adding anything significant, really. So it was only Neymar and Di Maria making the effort up front, which really didn't help PSG. Um, Riyad Mahrez, Phil Foden, Dinchenko, all of them had a great game, by the way, for, for Man City. I think 
I mean, there's four standouts for Man City in this one. The, the three that I mentioned, Mount Morris, Foden and Zinchenko, as well as Ruben Diaz in the back. There was tremendous game, really, uh, from these four in particular. Um, you know, with Morris and Foden terrorising the flanks for, for PSG, terrorising for Renzi and, uh, and Diallo. Phil Foden it was so quick and so mobile against someone like Florenzi, who, again, he's not re- he, does, he doesn't have so much in him. To give in terms of um, in terms of physicality, in terms of running and sprinting and and making physical effort and endurance, that Phil Foden was beating him, uh, him and Zinchenko as well were beating Florenzi in every chance that they have. Riyad Mahrez had high ways um, uh, on uh, on Diallo and on the other side really, he was terrorizing him, scored the goal, and you know, I mean, since the 30 minute mark really after half an hour in the first half. You knew that Man City uh, are in control of the game now, and that PSG completely lost the plot. And the second half was, I mean, literally a carbon copy of the second half of this first leg. Man City were cool, calm under pressure, rolling the ball really well, knowing when to press high, knowing when to play deep. PSG were nervous, they were making rash decisions, the changes were late from Pochettino, the game management was bad, and of course the nervousness and the physicality led to a red card from Di Maria that was so stupid that it was easily could have been avoided really, there was no need for that sort of stamp on, um, on Fernandinho, yes he might have provocated him a little bit, but I think Di Maria's decision was absolutely horrendous, deserved that card, and the game was, I mean, the game was already aggressive from the start, and that red card only added to it, because the game could have really, could have really, um, you know, went um, to, to two red cards, maybe three red cards, it would have gone to an absolute brawl, maybe, at the end of the game, because the PSG players, again, lost the plot, Paredes was, you know, all over the referee, Verratti was making problems, Neymar was making problems, and, you know, PSG are lucky, really, to have only one red card in this game, in my opinion. Um, again, the game management was bad from Pochettino, and by the time he made the substitutions, the red card was on, and City already settled and controlled the game and run away with the tie, really, and scored the second goal from Riyad Mahrez. Again, the spaces behind the flanks, the quality of Phil Foden and Riyad Mahrez shining through in the game, and they scored the second goal. Um, Messi did everything well in this game. It's just a great tactical management from Guardiola, great game plan, and executed to perfection. Defending really well, uh, defending deep well when they were, uh, were required to, pressed high really well, controlled the game really well, attacked really well, they moved well and created spaces well. They did almost everything. I mean, the pressing for Man City in particular was so amazing. I mean, five players, six players were in the box of, of PSG. I mean, sometimes at a certain point of the game, for like five or ten minutes, PSG didn't even get past the midfield point. Like, watching this game really made me feel bad for Bayern. Seriously, I was asking myself the whole game, like, how Bayern didn't make it through, how Bayern didn't win against PSG and didn't make it through with this kind of side, with this kind of collapse that they have in the second half, in both legs, really. PSG played 45 minutes in each leg, and that doesn't really make you, I mean, doesn't really make you deserving to qualify, particularly when you don't score your chances and when you don't really take the chances that you have in both legs, per se. So Man City did everything well. Guardiola had a perfect game in terms of managing his, um, you know, his uh, his tactics. Shout out again for Ruben Diaz, really in particular for his great fighting spirit. I mean, the um, there was a, there was a really moment of the game where I, I think Zinchenko blocked a shot from Neymar, and the way he was celebrating with Stones and Diaz, it was tremendous. I mean. The fighting spirit City showed last night was unbelievable, and they deserve to go to the final. For the first time in their history, they go to the Champions League final, and it is a big, big achievement. And again, people would say it's money, and people would point out that City spent over £1 billion and all of that. Yes, they did, but at least they have a sporting, I mean, sporting structure behind it, and they have a pretty sh- stable one as well. For the last 10 years or so, 12 years or so since the takeover from Sheikh Mansour, at least they have a pretty stable structure. Yes, the money played a big role, but I think, again, if you're going to be uh, talking about the money on its own, you're going to be really wrong because there is a sporting structure, there is a footballing project that is, you know, well built and well planned out 
from the uh, City group. Man City are going to be facing either Chelsea or Real Madrid in the semi-final. And, you know, they have a chance. They have a 50-50 against any of them, really, to go th uh, to go and win the Champions League. The, the title that eluded Pep since, uh, you know, going to Man City and since leaving Barcelona, pretty much. And eluded Man City themselves since that takeover, as we mentioned. They brought Guardiola for that role and they are one step closer to achieving that uh, particular objective. Congratulations for Man City, congrats for Guardiola, and in particular, congrats for the man of the match, in my opinion, Riyad Mahrez. And today, Man City will know who they're going to be facing in the final. Of course, the second time final second leg is going to be played today with Chelsea hosting Real Madrid. Both teams coming on the back of uh, crucial wins in their own leagues, of course. Real Madrid winning 2-0 against Osasuna with Zidane resting Bruce and Modric for this game, resting loads of players for this one, and he knows how important this one is. Um, Chelsea also rested some key players in their victory against Fulham, with, I think, Tuchel making the usual rotation that he insisted that he's going to be making um, this season. I think it's paying off dividends, really. When you look at what they're doing in this season, they're still in the top four fight. They still have a chance to win the Champions League, not just to go to the final, but to win it. And, you know, both with both sides having local priorities ahead of them, Real Madrid fighting for the title and Chelsea still involved in the top four. This game is going to be intriguing in so many ways. I mean, there's loads of questions that are going to be asked about this game. I mean, the first of which, who's going to be the team that's going to go for it? Because in the first leg, you saw that Chelsea had the first half for themselves. They really created opportunities. They scored. They should have scored more, obviously, because the chances they would have pretty much were, you know, some of them were point-blank range. Hello, Timo Werner. Seriously, the questions are, who's going to be going for it? Will Chelsea, um, you know, go for the juggler, go for the early kill against Real Madrid and, you know, try and take advantage maybe of them and just uh, and, and, and score and then settle at the back? to try and, you know, disturb Real Madrid and destabilize their system, or they would prioritize defense and just wait for the moment to, to strike. Because if we saw the first game, and if you saw the first leg, both teams were really convinced of the draw by the end. Like, none of them were going for a, um, for a killer, for a 2-1 or uh, from either side. By the 75th minute, Chelsea was settling in, Real Madrid was settling in, and nobody was really thinking, okay, the second goal coming. The game was... Everybody was convinced the game was going to be ending 1-1 since the 70th minute, really. So that's what happened, and the game ended 1-1. But this is different. This is, I think, the 90 minutes that are going to be defining, I think, either season for both sides. Because if Real Madrid get it to the Champions League uh, final, this is going to have a knock-on effect for their hopes in the league. And they will have, as they have a big game against Sevilla, this could be you know, a turnaround, just like the turnaround they had early on in the season when they defeated Sevilla and then went on to defeat Bruce Imch and Gladbach. And, of course, in between all of that, there was the derby uh, with Atletico Madrid they did, where they won and, um, and, you know, they kept themselves in the league fight um, in, in La Liga. And that was a turning point, I think, of their season, really. It changed a lot of perceptions about them and really gave them a boost ahead to go and reach the Champions League semi-final. Um, for Chelsea, I think the the um, the rotation from Tuchel, the fact that he's um, you know focusing on defending, he's getting what he wants to, really intrigues me about this game and makes me wonder maybe maybe Chelsea are going to be the ones defending. Maybe we're going to give in the ball to Real Madrid and see what they do with possession and defend really well, like tightening the spaces really well. The pressing is going to be intense as usual. That is going to be expected, really. Um, you know, there will be some sort of questions about the starting 11 for, for him. And after have its, you know, uh, brilliance in, in the weekend, maybe he should get to start ahead of Werner, maybe. Um, you know, play him as a false nine. I mean, he, he moves really well. He reads the spaces really well and is going to help in a lot of ways, really. And listen, I'm, this is not a slide against Timo Werner. I love the guy since his days at Leipzig. But I think he really fell down the drain in terms of his performance. He doesn't really have the same energy he has at Leipzig, at least in finishing. He does everything good around the game, but his finishing has, you know, has declined so much in the last couple of months for Timo Werner that it's impossible really to see him as a proper striker anymore now. 
at least until he picks himself up and i'm sure he would pick himself up back again because he's that is that good and he's that good for chelsea and they didn't bring him for like 50 million euros for nothing he they know his value and he knows his value and thomas Tuchel knows his value which is why he keeps giving him chances after chances after chances and he deserves those by the way he will come good and i think he he could come good maybe even in this game who knows um but again this game has intrigue all over it, really. We don't know who's going to be going for the kill. Chelsea, again, they're going to be playing for a nil-nil, but that's going to be dangerous, really, because Real Madrid are not a guarantee. Even at their worst, Real Madrid could still find a way and still find some solution to just, you know, um, make it happen, simply. To make it happen, to score goals or do whatever that they that they, they would want to and whatever they would like, really, um, in, in the game. Not dominate necessarily, but just score a goal and make that team sweat their fears out, really. And just look for the equaliser and frantically try and, and look for an equaliser and look for a way back into the game. And that's where Real Madrid do best, really. They score a goal, they put the pressure all on the opponents and they just leave them hanging and leave them high and dry and they defend really well. That's what they did for most of the second half of the season, really, um, to be fair with Zinedine Zidane, uh, finding new ways, really, to close down, finding new ways to play and to hit teams on the counter and to try and, and, and damage teams' defence. But I don't think Chelsea are particularly the same animal. The 3-5-2, we saw it really made a lot of trouble for, um, for Zinedine Zidane. The pressing of the midfield was intense. There was not the passing options that they usually had for the likes of Cruz and Modric. N'Golo Kante made a great game again, and, you know, uh, he, he really, he really uh, had the better of Tony Cruz and Modric all over the game. The uh, the support from Mason Mount and Jorginho was tremendous, and, you know, it was all about intensity in the first leg. So, really, this is going to be about who's going to be the team that has 90 intense minutes in them. Is it going to be Real Madrid? Is it going to be Chelsea? Who's going to be, um, whose defense is going to buckle down first? Whose team is going to make the mistake first? Whose midfield is going to make the mistake first? I think this is going to be a really, really tight game. Again, I don't want to watch a KG game because that really, um, you know, <laughs> That really is going to tamper my expectations and tamper my hype for this game. So I'm, I'm still hyped about it, of course, but I don't want to see a KG game. I mean, I hope not, but I'm sure the tactics will take over at a certain point and that would happen and we'll see the KG game eventually from one of the coaches. Um, anyway, my predictions for this game, I would say I, I would go for Chelsea. I would go for a 1-0 victory for Chelsea. The most important uh, events on the pitch might be in the Champions League, but off the pitch, I think the biggest story, and we can, we can really agree on that, is the announcement um, uh, of Ace Roma that Jose Mourinho is going to be the new coach starting from next season. This just took the, the world of football by storm, I would say. This was really surprising. Two weeks, just two weeks after being sacked by Tottenham Hotspur. Uh, Jose Mourinho finds a new job, a new home for him in back in Serie A again for the first time in 10 years as well. Um, 11 years exactly since he was coach of Inter Milan and took them to the treble, won the Champions League with them and, and was the last maybe true great coach for Inter since then, um, you know, until the return of Conte maybe to get them the Serie A this season. I mean, um, this was again, this was surprising for so many reasons because... Roma are not the kind of team we expect Jose Mourinho to take over, but I think at this point, after seeing him in Tottenham, you really are not you cannot be surprised. It's a contract, of course, for three years. It expires in June 2024, and Jose Mourinho obviously, you know, maybe will cherish this one because the first argument that pops to people's mind would be, okay, his football maybe works for Italy, but I don't think that anymore. The Serie A, I think, are way past the point of being a defensive league because if you watch this season. I mean, almost every game ends up with both teams scoring. Almost everyone. Every team scores against every team. And no team in Italy looks like they have this solid, um, you know, fortress of a defending. I mean, Inter, to a certain extent, do. But I think the other clubs in Italy do not have the luxury of having the strongest defensive performance or the strongest defensive lineup, really. I mean, again, every team scores against every team in the Serie A this season. And for the last couple of seasons, really. So... For Jose Mourinho, this is going to be definitely an intriguing challenge for him. This is a new kind of job for him uh, in, in Roma, but I think a good one. It, it really could suit him. Um, less pressure, obviously. 
less spotlight, I would say, but, but the media maybe would follow him there, really. They would want to know what he's going to be doing with Roma. Less media attraction, again, maybe. Less media attraction, who knows. Maybe they'll be all over him if, if they hear about the results for Roma um, next season. But I think, again, this is going to be less pressure on him. And more importantly, I would say, less egos to cause him problem in the locker room. Because the last couple of stints for him, the managerial since he has... Um, at Manchester United and at Tottenham, uh, this was the biggest problem, I think, for him, dealing with some players and being critical of some players in particular, the problems he had with Pogba, the problems he had with um, w- w- with Gareth Bale, with Tangin Dombele, with Dele Alli at Tottenham. Seriously, the problems he had with those players, I mean, are really um, maybe a justification for why this job would be good for him. Not having superstars in Roma would help um, he would he would command maybe the board to bring him any players that he wants to, which is again the kind of uh, mentality that he really relies upon mostly. So this is I think a marriage made in heaven for uh, for, for Jose Mourinho. Roma are hitting rock bottom in the last decade or so. You could you could say that the all of the Italian sides are hitting rock bottom since the turn of the decade because Juventus dominated and they barely have trophies to win here and there, Coppa Italia or something. But the league is completely Juve. But no, but now, after Inter Milan won the Serie A, and I think this could be a turning point. This could give the other teams in Serie A a chance, maybe see that Inter did it. Why couldn't they? Again, Roma hitting rock bottom, the lowest point really where they could miss Europe completely. At least they were a sort of regular fixture in the Champions League and then the Europa League for the last couple of years. But this season they could miss Europe altogether if they keep on going on the same road. Um, again, you, I mean, Jose Mourinho as well is hitting a low point in his career as well. Again, after the debacle that was his Tottenham stint um, as a manager and the way he was dealing with the media, the way he was dealing with the players, again, as you mentioned, this is going to be a chance for him and for Roma to both rejuvenate themselves, really, and revitalise themselves. Again, potentially with no European football next season, Jose Mourinho could comfortably focus on a domestic season, could focus on having the best finish that Roma could have, focusing on maybe getting those Champions League spots. Maybe, why not, with the um, with the uh, with the freedom maybe in the transfer market, choosing the players that he wants to, obviously acquainting to the market and acquitting to the uh, to the funds available for that club. He would maybe have a good domestic season where he could maybe get them to Champions League spots again, potentially win the league, who knows. Um, and, and this would be a pretty good way for Jose Mourinho to revitalize his career, to maybe get people talking about him in a positive manner again and saying, oh, this is the coach that achieved this and this and this. And, you know, maybe this would give him another opportunity to write his name on the map of international coaching again. Maybe, I mean, he looked really dead and buried in his career um, with Tottenham, really. His stint at Tottenham evolved into a um, into a sad picture, really, for a, you know, someone who, in the early goings of the 2010s, was one of the best managers in the world, if not the best. I mean, at certain points, there was nobody that was as tactically efficient as Jose Mourinho. And despite the, the defensive way he mostly plays, and despite the way that he focuses on the counter rather than playing possession-based football. So the biggest question is going to be whether this is going to be a revival for Mourinho or it's going to be the last chapter maybe for him at the top level football for the special one. Maybe goes to international football, coaches Portugal and retires. That is, I think, the the sort of the uh, logical path that people are expecting for him. But let's see what is going to be happening for Jose Mourinho. Let's see what's going to be happening with the special one in the um, in the Serie A with Roma. Hopefully for him, he would get them to a good place the next season. And congratulations for him. And we will see how he's going to be doing with the Wolves of the Italian capital. That's it from me for this episode. I was your boy, the HD of the PSP. Like, share, comment on the YouTube version of this podcast, subscribe to the YouTube channel, enable notifications to receive all the updates from these episodes and all the content on the channel of course follow us on social media on Instagram listen to the podcast on Spotify Google Podcast or any other platform and until next time I'll be seeing you soon